back to the Roundtable History Podcast. I'm really excited today. We're going to be here with Craig from NBS History. So, Craig, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Really excited today. We're going to be talking about historical movies, which ones land, which ones don't, and what makes a good historical movie. So, I'm really excited. As am I. And uh, I would say the first place to start right. would be uh, with The Last of the Mohicans. And I guess I'll mention mm -hmm. briefly that we're doing a review already, and that's why this is the first one, because it's going to come up anyways. Yeah, that's fine. All right, so since we're looking at historic movies, I thought we would start off with The Last of the Mohicans which we also happen to be doing a joint review on. Uh, I'm not sure if you want to start off for me. Again, because I feel like this movie was a little more personal to you, so I really <laughs> think you have some interesting things to say about it. Well, uh, since I did do the beginning part, or we'll try to, I mean, we overlapped, obviously. Uh, yeah, I didn't realize when we picked this movie how personal this was. So not to go into too much descriptions of my work and everything, I happen to work for an education board on uh, an Indian reserve, as I guess it would be called in the United States. And uh, the native reserve I work mm -hmm. for is a Mohawk reserve, uh, former Iroquois. So a lot of the people on this reserve actually participated and were filmed in this movie, including one of the elder chiefs, uh, Phillips, back then. And uh, some of the language is uh, Ganya Gea, which is the language of the Mohawks. But more or less, uh, the speakers in it, who are natives, they speak uh, a blend of uh, Lenape, Delaware, and uh, Cherokee and uh, Ganyagea. And uh, interestingly enough, two women from the reserve, I couldn't get their names, or should, probably shouldn't give them anyways, uh, they wrote almost all the dialogue for the Ganyagea scene in the film. So when I was doing this review, I actually uh, went around asking some people who knew things about it to try and get some sources. It was, uh, it was really interesting, and uh, I didn't expect all the things I found. Uh, what? I'm curious. What were their thoughts? Do they think the movie portrays the events pretty fairly to Native Americans? Like, what are they? What do they think about the film? It's um, it's pretty mixed. But it's, not, it's really not that bad because the only thing that they actually have some issues with is there's this stereotype in Native communities. It's called the Stoic Native. It's when they just have their arms folded, they don't smile, and they just don't talk in film. And apparently they unbelievably hate this and think it's a really racist stereotype. That's the only thing I ever heard from anybody. Uh, but overall, everyone was extremely impressed with the fact that they were using actual Native language. Uh, Mind you, um, the Ganya Geha is not great in the film because no one was a native speaker. Uh, Wes Studi, who played the protagonist, who was a Huron, he had, I'd say, about almost all the lines in Ganya Geha. But himself, he's a Cherokee, and he's fluent in Cherokee. So most of the time, he's just simply speaking Cherokee. So he's phonetically trying to speak the language, as he also does in French, which, I mean, I don't want to... <laughs> be smirk him but it's pretty funny to hear him speak french mm -hmm. um yeah it's uh other than that um actually you had made a point when we were talking before about the use of just you know bows and arrows and instead they're actually picking up muskets like they're supposed to be that's uh it's another good point for the movie i'd say and I first heard about this and I know it's an adaptation from a much older book I was kind of surprised that one of the principal characters was white and I had a little bit of a gut instinct wondering oh is this Hollywood whitewashing <laughs> but looking into the history and doing some research there's a book um, I don't know if readers are familiar but the many captivities of Esther Wheel Wheelwright and this was about a woman who was a British subject I mean she was a child of English settlers, but she was actually during a raid captured by natives and adopted and raised as a native. And the book talks a lot about how that was a very common thing that natives would adopt European children, either during war because of war or through trade and through marriage to make alliances. 
and it wasn't uncommon. And even Esther's story is fascinating because she then goes to the French and ends up being a mother superior at a convent. So she's been in kind of three different nations and really done the lay of the land in North America. So I was interested to see just how much love there was between Hawkeye and his adopted father and his adopted brother, because from what I've read, that's actually pretty accurate. Yeah, it's very accurate. Um, when I was doing my undergrad, I actually had a phenomenal teacher. His name was uh, Gavin Taylor, and he specialized in uh, relations between European colonials during the early years with the natives. And uh, he taught us this uh, quite often. Um, it was rampant. Uh, during the morning wars, especially, natives would take a lot of prisoners uh, and captives and adopt them as family members because the purpose of native warfare prior to European arrival was to uh, take captives to replace your loved ones that were killed. That was kind of their system. And when the Europeans showed up, they did the exact same thing to the whites. So this was this was not seen in racial terms. There's actually a quite countless amount of stories of uh, white people who lived amongst Indians and stayed, even given the choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Daniel Day Lewis. There was like, another book that uh, it talks about kind of, you know, even Cora in the movie gives the speech about how the militia shouldn't have to listen to the British because they shape the land with their own hands. So there's a little bit of frontier, frontier thesis there. But at the same time, the movie is also really good at showing the importance of information. Uh, there's a book by Alexander Dukovsky, uh, Informed Power, and it talks about how information itself and like trails and just knowledge of the land was an extremely important form of capital that natives held and then used in order to gain leverage against other groups or with interactions with Europeans. And so I really like how the film portrayed that even knowledge of um, web not being able to come to the aid of the fort and those messages getting intercepted or tweaked or even just the scouting and like what makes a safe trail and safe passage and how both groups of natives are able to leverage that and actually have agency in their interactions with Europeans. I thought that was really interesting. And for a movie from 1992, I mean, a lot of the books that I've read on the subject are far after that. So it's really cool that a movie, you know, created much earlier was somewhat at least somewhat forward thinking on some of those topics. Yeah, they loosely touch upon the aspect that the natives had interest in this war. They were playing both sides. They had a big part and a lot of, you know, the literature, the literature touches upon this more, but in movies, we almost hardly ever see that. They're almost just treated as these indifferent, uh, you know, savage like people who are just being the victims of everything going around them. I think in my review, I even touched upon it a bit, particularly for uh, I'll call it the Iroquois Confederacy, they weren't participating in the war for so mm. long because initially the French were winning. Mind you, this was under a Prussian general, but for a long time the French were winning and the Iroquois were terrified of this because they didn't want to be on the losing side. So they stood back, they allowed things to go as they did, and as soon as the British had turned the tails on everyone, then they officially allied themselves, the wampum was given, and they participated because they were just working in their best interests. And I think this movie kind of, it captivates that a little bit, especially with the character Wes Studi plays, because he's playing this almost double agent role, although it, it is for personal reasons, mm -hmm. obviously. I found that was interesting. It, it, it honestly, it does seem like a movie that's a little before its time. It's so fascinating. And I think you bring up a good point that you know, in the historiography and public eye recently, it, it is important to acknowledge the things that were done to Native Americans and the things that happened to them after the Columbian exchange. Like, it, it was a tragedy. You know, I, I think a lot of scholars would use the word genocide, and I don't necessarily disagree. But at the same time, they weren't just victims i think to only portray them as victims kind of infantilizes them a little bit and takes away their agency so i agree with you that this movie and any sort of media source or book that gives them agency and shows that they had agendas they had nations they interacted as nations and even though in the end they lost they had power they had capital and they leveraged it and so i think it's really interesting how the movie is showing that especially for being 20 some odd years ago. I like how you use the word uh, infants there because in all the literature, this is you know the, the trope that's put on them that uh, the settlers and the whites, we always 
made them the children and as if we were the adults taking care of them and this always put them in this odd position where they were powerless but it really wasn't true initially we were dependent on them and most of the wars they were fighting half of the battles for us so it, it's it was interesting especially in this movie I mean, to not even know that an an allied army 12 miles away is able to assist and within striking distance, like they wouldn't have even known that if not for native information networks. Like Hawkeye's the one who brings that up. And that shows that 12 miles through wilderness, um, for which you're not so familiar, could be huge if you had natives or native allied or native adopted peoples who could help you through that. Yeah, and I... I mentioned this in my review. I found out that um, the situation that you were talking about when Montcalm had received the letter from the scout and found out that the uh, detachment from Webb wasn't coming to help Fort William Henry, Fort William Henry and Fort Edward were so close together that they would have heard the cannon fire. So this thing that they were portraying in the film is actually wrong. Edward, Webb was never sending forces because he was... I, I've read some different reports about him being a little bit uh, too precautious and he needed his forces to maintain his own fort, mm. but he simply was never sending them anyways. It's not that he didn't know. The, the letter was... Yeah, and that makes say, sense with the cannon fire, but, you know, I'll give the movie a pass on that. That's almost getting a minor detail wrong to portray yeah. sort of the feeling better, like... I get why they're doing that. They're showing the audience the importance of information and trails and the importance of using natives to have this network of information. So I get why they would get that wrong because I think it kind of illustrates an important feel of the era. Oh, I, I think I even failed to mention at the beginning. I, I think an interesting thing that's going on is we're both doing a review of this movie and we're kind of on the opposite sides of the uh, spectrum here because I, uh, I myself am Canadian, I'm from Quebec, so I've learned this history from the most propaganda-based, oh, it's it's awful, the Quebec government teaches a, an anti-history that kind of twists everything around to make the French look like victims and everything, whereas you, from the most part, probably are looking at this film and you see all the influences it has for the future of the American Revolution, right? Kind of watching it, I can definitely tell there's an American hand because every interaction between the colonial militia and the British is, you know, they're talking about the French Indian war, but they're really not like the way it's taught in American schools and the way, even cause I'm a middle school teacher. I don't know if I've mentioned that oh, yeah. um, in a lot of my videos, but it's really taught as just a precursor to the American revolution. Like, Oh, you know, here was the French Indian war and it cost the British a lot of money and so they decided to tax the Americans more and scrutinize them more. And then that's where we get the revolution. It's really just a precursor. And then it's never touched on again. Yeah. Um, when I entered a university at the undergrad level, um, I'd say probably 50% is American history that I learned. And it's the exact same in university. That's how we're taught. So I, I see both angles. And mind you, I, I kind of agree with teaching it as a precursor to the revolution because it, it's such a significant part of it and the grievances that led to the American Revolution, especially with, uh, I'm not sure if you call it the same in the United States, the Quebec Act, when Quebec ended up getting a lot of territory that was more or less should have gone to the settlers and it really aggravated them. We focus on for settlers being angry and a lot of American literature focuses on is the proclamation of 1763. Yeah. And a lot of modern books really focus on how it wasn't necessarily government laws changing how settlers acted. It was often the other way around that settlers were going to go west and break laws and create these sort of conflicts with Native Americans that helped fuel the French Indian War. And then the governments and the states had to react. Yeah, that's very true. Uh... You know, I think maybe you want, just for the audience who hasn't uh, maybe seen this or hasn't thought of it fully, do you want to go through some of the situations, events, or themes that lead to the American Revolution in this film? Because I, I don't touch upon it because I honestly believe that you would go much more in depth into this. Mm -hmm. 
so from the very beginning it's like within the first 14 minutes when the british are calling for the colonial militia to assist in the defense of uh, fort william henry the colonial militia have terms and they actually get into kind of a philosophical argument that where are your loyalties is it to your family or is it to the crown what is the obligation of the crown to the people the people to the crown and that's a very american revolution style idea which is what is the pact if you know one of the things american school children are taught is no taxation without representation this idea that without a say in parliament and without the ability to have colonial assemblies then the bond between the british and the colonists is basically severed so that comes up in the first 14 minutes in the movie and then at fort william henry once the colonists hear that uh, homesteads are starting to get destroyed and massacred the colonists want to leave and defend their home and they argue that they had an agreement and it was part of their condition to serve with the militia that they would be allowed to go home and defend their farms and then monroe steps in and says no your obligation is the crown and to defeating the french and so one of the big points in the film is hawkeye actually gets arrested and is going to be tried for sedition and hanged because he helped some of these colonial militia escape. And so those kind of clashes between obligations to crown and obligations to home really kind of look forward into the American Revolution and how as Britain exercises more and more control, at least in the eyes of the colonists, the colonists start chafing under that. And that's viewed, at least in traditional American kind of the zeitgeist like that's why the american revolution happened oh, and uh i think probably talk about the big one in this film i know you probably i haven't seen your review of course but I, I imagine you go into depth into the story behind the fort william massacre if maybe you want to talk about uh your point of view and everything that you read about it I'm going to be honest, and this is one of the reasons I enjoyed reading your script so much. It doesn't really come up. Like, we already, in my eighth grade curriculum, passed that, and we never even talked about it. It's just kind of, I don't even know if they say it by name in a lot of the readings. It's just kind of, there were massacres, but now let's get to the proclamation of 1763 and the colonists are mad. Like... I don't know. In French schools, is it much more important? Or uh, French Canadian schools, is it much more important? Because I don't think we really. I, I know as a kid, I never went through it. It's um. No, it, it's in high school. We're not. Uh, well, it's very watered down in high school because uh, the way the Quebec government goes about everything, they don't want to even teach you about Canada. Quebec has an antagonistic relationship with Canada, so they only want to teach anything revolving around Quebec. But this entire situation hmm. is a tricky one because the commander of the Nouvelle France's forces was very anti-colonial uh, and he's notoriously hated in Quebec history. And this was a big victory for him. So they just, you know, they say, oh, it was a big victory for him and he moved on and they don't talk about the massacre. But I know in literature, this, especially contemporary uh, during that time, this was a huge propaganda piece to to slander the uh, the French for what had happened, which was a it was a horrible situation, mind you. The, the reason to uh, rage about this, but um, the way this film goes about it, I have to add, it's the only thing I really had a problem with history uh, historically. And if you want, I can go into that. That's uh, mostly my review. <laughs> Uh, that, that's how much you want to tip your hat, but I was just curious because I, I read your script before getting to this part of the film and you had a lot of quotes from Mount Calm about how he viewed colonial style warfare and how he thought it was excessively brutal. And in the movie when they, he literally like leans over and whispers, well, we can't kill them and prevent them from fighting us again, but maybe somebody could wink, wink, nudge, nudge. It like blew my mind when I'd already seen his quotes and his actual like primary source data versus how the film portrays Montcalm. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go into it once. I'm just going to put up a picture of Montcalm. There we go. Okay. Le Marquis de Montcalm. So I'll do this as fast as I can. In Quebec history, 
Uh, there was a new governor at this point during the war. It was Governor Vaudreuil. And Governor Vaudreuil was born in Quebec, so he's a colonial, uh, much like the, the figures you see in this movie. And he has an extremely antagonistic relationship with a general that's brought over from France, who is the Marquis de Montcalm. This is real in history. And the Marquis de Montcalm was extremely angered to even be in this conflict. He thought it was beneath him to be in the uh, the colonies. No one cared about them. He wanted to be in a real war, as he would say, in France. And he thought this was a waste of his time and that it was shameful to be there in the first place. So when he had come over, he was replacing a, I always forget the name of a Prussian general who won a ton of battles for the French. And he honestly, he made a great use of the natives and he would use their guerrilla warfare tactics quite well. When Montcalm came over, the first few battles, he got to see natives for the first time and he was disgusted. His, his journal's just full of him saying how much he thinks they're a savage people. Uh, the scalping was disgusting. It was barbaric. The way they treat women and children, the way the warfare goes, he was completely against it. And he said that while this might have worked before, this wasn't going to be the norm anymore because he was, in his words, bringing it into European footing. Like, uh, I had some quotes from him. Yeah, in French, les méthodes coloniales ont fait le temps de la guerre. Maintenant, il était établi la façon européenne. Yeah, basically, he's saying we need cannons, artillery, proper formations and everything. You don't just run in the woods. Mind you, this is what was winning the French the war in the first place, was using native tactics. So, Vaudreuil mm -hmm. was someone who notoriously used these tactics because he was like a, an American militiaman. He was out there with the guns and with the natives on the frontier. There's a lot of, uh, it's very similar histories between Quebec and the United States in the early days. It was the exact same relationship where the Americans were feeling the British officers were impeding on them by, you know, getting close to the revolution. For Quebec, it was the same thing. So when Montcalm, Montcalm came over, he didn't only hate the natives. He absolutely hated the Quebec militiamen. He thought they were idiots. I mean, he had a good, good reason to believe so. They weren't well trained and they didn't do formations and he had weeks to try and train them. And he thought they were not up to standard. So he would only use French soldiers if he could. He would almost never use the militiamen, and he would try not use the natives. Now, during this uh, massacre that happened at the fort, uh, the movie doesn't depict it quite properly. The beginning of the massacre was actually natives running into the fort, finding the wounded and sick that were left behind and brutally killing them and scalping them, stealing what they could because they wanted to plunder. They, that's why they were there mm -hmm. for the war. That was the reason for them being there. That's how they do warfare. And Montcalm uh, was freaking out, and he was disgusted by this. Uh, I have a famous quote where he says, if you're looking for the bodies, just go around the fort. Although this wasn't at Fort William Henry, mind you, it was another fort. And uh, he even saw some natives uh, digging out graves, trying to steal redcoats off people. Really stuff that disgusted Montcalm and... Uh, it, it made him, from then on end, never use him again. But for the actual massacre that took place, the way this movie depicts it is Montcalm is speaking to uh, Magua, the character who apparently speaks for all the Indians, mind you, which is weird. And uh, he winks at him, and just like you said, and he's like, you know, I told them that they can march and do this, and they're free to go, but you could kill them, you know? And he insinuates to go and kill them. The actual history is... There was a French escort at the front of the march protecting these people. And when Montcalm found out about the massacre taking place, he personally intervened. And he got all the people he found captive, ransomed them to get them back, and brought them you know, pro properly back to the, um, the army march. It's, it's just blatantly against the actual history. Montcalm was disgusted by this. And uh, Montcalm will... Everyone would argue in Quebec, Montcalm lost the war for Nouvelle France because he didn't use natives afterwards. So it's the exact opposite of his character. Mind you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, no, no continue. Uh, I was just going to say, the funny thing is they depict Montcalm as kind of an asshole, which he was <laughs> in a lot of ways, <laughs> but uh, not for the mm -hmm. same reasons. I find it interesting. I, we'll probably talk about this later when we get to the Patriot, but <laughs> yeah. I, there's just something about American movies where, you know, for as much as this film has nuance with natives, there has to be a quote unquote bad guy. And the Patriot does this too, where 
sometimes films just need to trust the audience and you don't need to make every antagonist be like the super or Hitler and have them do everything as horribly as possible. Like, I don't know, we'll get to this with the Patriot, but just trust your audience to be able to understand that there's two sides. One is the protagonist and then kind of let the history breathe. I've noticed so many American films do that or films that target American audiences. You know what? I, I think actually it would be probably an appropriate time to dabble in the Patriot, which I'm I'm not gonna lie, and I know it's horrible to say as a historian. It's like I love this film. <laughs> I've always as as a youngster, I love watching this film. I mean, it, it's hard not to, even though it's really mm-hmm. wow, wow, really inaccurate. And I mean, it, it's hard not to see the British as Nazis. <laughs> film just it's so heavy-handed. It's like okay. All right. Yeah, now they're going to kill prisoners. Now they're going to burn down the church with women and children. Now they're going to kill his son. Now they're going to like, okay, do you get it yet, audience? Like, they're the bad guys. But I think you're right. And I think that's an important nuance. And I talk about this with Enemy at the Gates a lot, too. I like Enemy at the Gates. I did a whole review blasting like every bit of history in Enemy at the Gates. But as a film, I still like it. Yeah, I love it. And same with The Patriot. Like, if The Patriot's on TV, I will watch The Patriot. I'll even show my students the Battle of Cowpens just to be like, okay, look at their formations. Like, don't go too far into it. Just kind of watch the formations so you can kind of visualize what it we think it looked like when they fought. Yeah, you you definitely are gonna have to a, enjoy it. You will definitely have a stronger background in this because you know, for the life of me, I studied the American Revolution, but. The Battle of Cowpens wasn't. The Battle of Cowpens happened, but from what I understand, like Cornwallis was not involved in this. Yet the movie has him directly there on the field. <sighs> I think they did a lot of compression. Um, I don't know. The film's not too clear. I think, you know, when they're doing a lot of the guerrilla warfare, it looks kind of swampy. So I don't know if it is trying to be a little more accurate and show that there was guerrilla warfare in the South. And that kind of was the style. But one thing that it really overlooks, except at the very beginning, is most movies really don't cover loyalists well enough. And (laughs) a lot of academic literature now is kind of reminding us like, no, loyalists were a thing. And a lot of people were either loyalist or undecided. I mean, John Adams gave the thirds rule that, you know, is a third patriot, third loyalist, a third didn't care. Um, I've read recently Alan Taylor's American Revolutions. And the reason he names that is he basically argues it was the first American Civil War, that there was such a loyalist presence and such a patriot presence that it really was two groups of Americans fighting ideologically for what the future would look like and so it's an interesting argument that they really were having between americans this disagreement should we have loyalty to the crown and parliament or should we have more control at home actually i find it really interesting you bring that up because well all the loyalists that left the united states they became canadians that's where i canada is actually english now mostly so when we're taught in history the foundations of Canada, we learn a lot about the loyalists and how they came over, especially for minor, well, not minor stories. Uh, the British, all the freed blacks after the war, they ended up mostly in uh, Nova Scotia. That's why Nova Scotia has a large black population. Like, that's one thing that really, really kind of bothers me about the movie. <laughs> and even Gettysburg, if we get to race in that movie is an issue like when they flee the main town and they're at the beach they're with all those happy black people and i think even history buffs pointed this out yeah and like man they sure are happy but if they're in south carolina like i think they are like they're they're not free movie and you know then the the one guy the guy who's in uh the actual irregular band he's fighting for his own freedom on the american side that's not and possible <laughs> the british from recent literature most black soldiers fought for britain 
because Britain was the one literally promising them their freedom, whereas America was basically continuing to promise chains. And the Patriot flips that right around. I don't know if you want to bring this up because I know he's... I don't know from an American point of view if he's a hero or not, but the character Mel Gibson is loosely based off of Francis Manuel, or uh, I, I don't know, I would say that in French, I have no idea how you would say it, the the Swamp Fox. He, yeah. he kind of embodies this argument with the slaves because from what I've read and was taught in school, he was a psychopath who brutally raped his slaves, killed natives for fun, during the French Indian War, like he actively really persecuted the Cherokees, and he was kind of a, a terror to uh, the slaves on his plantation, and they all fled during the war to run to the British, apparently. He really is only glossed over in like in the eighth grade version, the version for like secondary school students, that he was clever and it was smart fighting in the dense, you know, denser area of the South to fight with guerrilla tactics that that was intelligent and look at how clever and you know it's that american ingenuity whereas yeah all academic literature talks about the you know america was fighting for slavery basically yeah. but i don't know actually i'm really curious can we pause for a second because i have an eighth grade textbook and now i'm kind of curious i want to go grab it and see yeah, sure. what it says about him all right i'm gonna pause real quick because i think that'd be interesting if it yeah, here I'll, we'll, I'll do tell because I think it is interesting because the information on this particular character when I had to learn about him in university was I was really surprised having seen this film when I was younger. I was like, oh my god, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. So for perspective on a couple different events, out of a 700 page textbook, what an American 8th grader gets to learn U.S. history from like Native Americans all the way through the Industrial Revolution, 700 pages, there are, there's one page on the French Indian War, a <laughs> single page. Wow. There is like, ha yeah, there is half a section called Conflict in the Ohio Valley. Yeah. There is a single page on the war itself, and then it skips right to the Proclamation of 1763 and then the Stamp Act. So that lets you know... <laughs> How much it's glossed over in American history and the overall chapter is why the colonists broke apart so it's entirely just before the stamp act before the sugar and tea acts here's the French Indian and that's it huh. so I'm surprised I that is so different usually they really bolster whenever yeah. war happens and there's a lot of information that's I'm surprised <laughs> Yeah, no, they really don't care. Um, I'm trying to see. Okay, the war moves south is a single page. Then it gets to Cornwallis. Here's what it says. This is what an American eighth grader will learn about Francis Marion. One of them was Francis Marion, who was also known as the Swamp Fox. Marion's band of rebels harassed the British with hit-and-run raids. They attacked and then faded into the swamps and forests like foxes. Then on to Nathaniel Green. So nothing about slaves, nothing about his perceptions. An eighth grader will never, unless the teacher scaffolds, which, you know, I try to, will never look at the role of slavery and race in the American Revolution unless the teacher works that in. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> I, it's like, wow. <laughs> yeah, this is supposed to be the progressive textbook, too. Like, I don't, I don't know if I want to say the name, but this series is supposed to be better. And in some cases, like it, when it gets to the Civil War, it is. But that's it. So I find it interesting that in Canadian schools, his interactions with slaves and the role of slavery in the southern part of the American Revolution are actually taught to French school children. Or why do I keep saying French? French Canadian school children in much more depth than American school children. Well, I will have to admit, the one thing you have to look at, especially when it comes to Canadian history, is it's really, really boring. We didn't <laughs> have a lot going on. So we learn 50% of our history is American history. And the foundation of Canada, you can't not talk about the, this war. It's kind of our birth in a lot of ways. 
So especially for Nouvelle France, mm-hmm. it, it marks the end of French rule in North America. So it's kind of the biggest event I would say for Quebec. Yeah, kind of, pretty much. That makes so much more sense because most like academic history now is transnational. Like that book, American Revolutions, is cons. It, it actually brought up, and I never really thought about this. It talked about how when you know, the first and second continental Congress were meeting Canada actually voted on whether or not they wanted to leave. And like the Caribbean islands voted and all of Britain's colonies knew this was happening Mm -hmm. and they had these votes, but they decided to remain with Britain. Yeah, And I never thought about how these colonies would interact, but it totally does. So it's interesting that Canadian school children are taught that and they have that much more transnational view than American children. Uh, you know, it, it goes both ways because Canada, just like you were mentioning how uh, the slavery issues glossed over for this in American high school for the uh, Revolutionary War, it, it is similar in Canada. We have the we have the exact same tropes where we try and not acknowledge things, but uh, the issue is the birth of our nation is, I guess you could call it a counter revolution to the Amer- American Revolution. We both were born almost at the same mm-hmm. time, but we just chose the other side. It's kind of how we see it, I guess. And on, in a lot of ways, I don't know if yeah. you've ever heard this, Canadians view themselves as how we're not American. It's the only way to describe ourselves, because we're basically the same thing. So, <laughs> historically, it's, uh, it's like it's the only thing we can point out. That's interesting. One thing that I found fascinating, too, when we were talking about interactions with natives... In the United States, on our standardized tests, like I teach in Michigan, and we have a question on our state test every single year about different colonial groups interacting with natives. And you know who is actually viewed by Michigan and Americans as the nicest to the natives? It's the French. The question says, which group was most likely to intermarry and trade fur rather than have outright conquest? And the answer is France. No. They're given like France, England, Spain, and you know, then they make one up. Now, you know what? I have something to say about this because so I, the... I have something really cheeky to say about this because in Quebec history, they're literally, it will literally be worded like this. The English were brutal to the Indians. The Spanish were brutal to the Indians. The French were of the best of friends to the Indians and always were. It's, it's so blatantly wrong. The French were the smallest group in North America. We had no population. We had no hope in hell of surviving they had to rely on natives that's why they were being friendly i'll call it that that's why they were intermingling because they just could not produce a population we had to bring over ships of women at one point called la fille de roi just to populate france because it was such a problem the english did not have this problem well initially with the pohatan thing i I, yes of course but after that you were pretty Mm -hmm. good and the spanish were well, I mean, <laughs> so I just thought you'd find it. that, and that's the thing. Things yeah. there's so much compression; they don't get to that point. They don't say, "Well, the French were nice because they had to be," like you say, for population concerns. But literally every single year, that's a question, and I've told my kids, "I'm like, you better know if you see France and you see natives on a question, the answer is intermarriage and fur trade, even though we're leaving out." Well, they had to. That's what we're taught too. It's the exact same thing. We're taught uh, that the English... It's about this a lot with bears. What? I'll continue. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just saying, when when I talked with Barris, like, it's amazing how who decides to get into history and why it's so much predicated upon, like, how they're taught history in schools. And a lot of people get into history because they rebel against it. And a lot of people bounce off history because there's so much compression and so much of it's wrong. And a lot of college students are just revulsed because they're taught history one way in middle school and high school. Then they go to university and they have to like relearn everything, including historical methodology. And it just bounces so many people off. We had a long talk about that. That's certainly what I ran into in university. I mean, I was, I don't know if I even mentioned this. I'm actually not predominantly a history student. It's my second degree. I am actually, uh, my degree is in neuroscience and that's what I do for work. But uh, I like history and I wanted to always be a historian. But when I was growing up, I was told that there was no jobs and that I shouldn't do that. 
but I still otherwise took all my secondary courses in history and managed to get myself a degree and facing a choice now if I were to get a master's degree in either I might do the history one I've been thinking about it and when I went to university it's like you have to unlearn everything you learned in high school oh yeah same, same for me uh i think the only I, if you do get a master's i really like the master's classes like they tend to be smaller and a lot more of it is like historiography and critical thinking and yeah. being able to critique sources and analyze sources it's not just kind of like oh you learned a narrative in high school it's wrong here's a different narrative it's better you actually learn how to do more of that interpretation and analysis yourself yeah I, i'm really looking forward to it because i'm actually I mean, I, it's weird. I guess people would find it very weird how I have these two completely different degrees, but I'm a lot more comfortable in history. And it's, you know, mm -hmm. when you're passionate about something, it's so much easier to learn. And I writing, oh, yeah. you know, 20 page paper thesis on anything. I love that in history. If I have to do that in neuroscience, I kind of want to shoot myself. So uh, I'm looking forward to if I do make the choice, but uh, that's going to be in the future because right now it's just work. <laughs> yeah. And that's, it is so tough, like, you know, because like you say, you're writing 20 page papers in grad school, and then I work full time teaching. And then it's like, if I do a YouTube video, then I'm doing basically a 20 page script for that. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, as of now, I'm not monetized. So that's just kind of a labor of love. It's like double grad school. But yeah, I we're both in the same situation. With so YouTube. far, it's, yeah, so when uh, they change the monetization so you have to have a thousand subscribers because I actually have an old YouTube channel I never mentioned. I used to make money off of, uh, it was just gaming based when I was younger, but everything's changed and it's, it's significantly harder now. Uh, yeah. You know, the only thing else on the Patriot I want to touch on, and it's the most obvious, and if you ever look up critical reviews of this film, it's the characterization of uh, Tarleton. The, the green dragoon mm -hmm. uh, I guess he's a uh, yeah he's an SS officer I believe in this film working to burn women and children in the church yes want to mention that I know people bring it up all the time it's an actual event World War two in France where this occurred and that has to be where they got the idea to do it in this film because I mean do, do people actually believe the British would burn their own colonists in a church? <laughs> like, wow I, I, I think people might find it plausible because it's not used as much anymore but tarleton's quarter was an american saying i heard about that yeah like yeah and it's been a while but i think there are some accounts i could be talking out of my ass but i think there are some accounts that even the actual battlefield massacre was in some part misunderstanding and not even necessarily how it was portrayed by the American side. And then like you say, to invent fictional war crimes to pin under him. <laughs> it's just nuts. Oh, his, his whole, his character, his facial remarks, like I'm even looking on, on YouTube, he, he really portrays this. Like, he, he's out there to kill Americans. They, they wouldn't even refer to these mm -hmm. people as Americans at this point. They're still colonists. I mean... He, he captures people and he's brutalizing them. They, they want to win the people over. They're still loyalists. It's like, it's really ridiculous in a lot of ways. I get calling them rebels and stuff like that language yeah. is certainly in use, but the view of a true loyalist is that they were still subjects of the crown. They, they wouldn't want to just call them aliens and outsiders and Americans. I'm trying to see if in the textbook it touches on it at all. I think even Cowpens has gotten written out of this book. Oh, really? I thought that was a really important battle. Um, I it in an older version. But I'm looking now. I didn't hear anymore. The actual, like, title that skips from Valley Forge to Monmouth to... New Yorktown. Yeah. Yeah, they're just written it out. You know, I know because but I, I know. viewed your channel, I did watch your Enemy at the Gates review. Do you want to dabble into that? Because I, I honestly, I I find that's a, a great movie to talk about. 
Yeah, if you don't mind dislikes. Like, <laughs> the warning I give to anyone is World War II, especially on the Eastern Front, is so fraught and, like, you will run into literal Nazi sympathizers and you will run into mm -hmm. people, I think they're affectionately referred to as tankies, who believe Stalin did nothing wrong. But, yeah, Enemy at the Gates, um, you know, for being 2001... It is very much a movie cloaked in kind of the Cold War. Like from the get-go, the thesis of the movie is that Vasily Saitsev and the standard Soviet citizen were basically put in more danger by the Soviet government than by the invading Germans. And, you know, right off the get-go from the movie, the entire beginning is just it's almost straight up cold war propaganda. Like the, the stat I give in the review during the September crisis. So like September 21st, 22nd, around that time when the Germans really did reach the Volga, it looked like the battle could be lost. There were 1,218 men detained by the NKVD, which was basically the uh, communist secret police. And only 20 some odd men were actually publicly executed. And the movie shows, first of all, in the beginning, the stereotypical Soviet trope of, like, man with the rifle shoots, man without the rifle follows. Yeah, and I've yeah. read a lot of more recent literature of Stalingrad, and there definitely were equipment and ammo shortages. But looking at primary sources, a lot of Soviet soldiers complained about running out of ammo in the middle of fights. And not being well supplied enough in the middle of the fight. Not that they were sent out without necessary weapons from the get-go. And that's like the 13th Guards Division. They definitely wrote in their own archive about not having ammo. But before they crossed the Volga, they remedied that. And they were able to scrounge it up. They weren't just sent out there to get killed. And then the other thing is... Like I said, so 21 or so men, I think it might have been as high as 23, were killed in those two days by the NKVD. In the movie, when they do the suicide charge across the square at the German line oh, yeah. and then retreat, you see more men than were actually killed in those days machine gunned by their own commissars. Order so, 227, I believe it was called. Or... 227, um, not one step back. And... The spirit of the order, like if you read Stalin's actual words, when Fallblau, um, Operation Blue in English, the invasion of the Caucasus and Stalingrad and the Donbass region, when that kicked off, the Soviets retreated. And despite what books from like the 60s and 70s say, it wasn't an intentional retreat. It wasn't like the Soviet, you know, the, the trope in uh, Alan Clark's Barbarossa is the Soviets learned from the encirclements of 1941. And so they pulled back in the face of the Panzers, saved a lot of men. That's not true. Like Stalin and the generals actually wanted the men to stay and fight. But in small groups and like at a divisional and a regimental level, not even divisional, I say more like regimental and below battalion level, men pulled back because they, they knew the score. They didn't want to become encircled. And they retreated so far so quickly that Stalin felt the need to do Order 227 to remind them, like, hey, the Soviet Union is a big country, but the land runs out eventually, so we're going to put the NKVD behind you and create these things called blocking detachments, and they will have guns at your back, and you better stop retreating. And let's not mention... But the... the the, uh, the order that you're talking about, the 227, it was in August 1942... The events of this film, I believe, are closer to 41. So the order wasn't in place just, just yet. Um, Stalingrad is... The film starts with uh, the September crisis. So like September yeah, okay. 20th, 1942. So the order was in place. But the order was to prevent men from falling back across the Donbass region. And just ceding ground all the way to the Volga. It didn't want you know, operational level retreats. I guess for uh, people who don't know, tactical level, if you see that in literature, it's kind of like where my individual units are going. Like if you're playing a game like Counter-Strike or Call of Duty, that's tactical. Like where do I place small formations of dudes and tanks to win a battle? 
operational is you're looking at like divisions and core and cities. Like I'm in one sector of a battlefield. How do I win? How do I take the city of Stalingrad? That's kind of operational. And then strategic is more like which countries and resources am I going for? That's going to be like a Hearts of Iron 4 style thinking. So the order wasn't like, I want to keep 100 dudes from retreating. 227 was on an operational level, like, I don't want my entire battle line to give up 200 miles again, or we're going to run out of territory and resources. Yeah. And that's like, yes, there were machine guns and blocking detachments behind units. And I've seen some historians argue that they fired. And one of the best historians for this, uh, David Glantz, for all his Stalingrad books, all four of these giant volumes, he simply says the men of the Soviet Union knew these blocking detachments were behind. Uh, historian, I believe, Chris Evans, he does say like that these guys would sometimes machine gun their own. But the data in Glantz's own work and in Michael K. Jones' work and others... 22 men killed in those two days by the NKVD. And you see more, and they were publicly executed. Like the Soviet Union wasn't stupid. They knew if they wanted to keep men from retreating, you stand someone up in front of the entire unit, you shoot them in the head and say, don't let that be you. Yeah, or you shoot and in the movie, battalion. it's just look at these. Yeah. Or they go to a penal battalion and that's like, almost a million men were detained by the NKVD, but most of them, most of them were either sent back to the fight or put in penal battalions. The goal of 227 was to keep men fighting, to keep men doing a military objective. And the movie makes it seem like, no, they're just killing their own. And it's like, well, they would want those 50 dudes. If they have to kill one to get the other 49 to fight, like they definitely would. Or like you say, the penal battalions, like, all right, you 50 men just signed up for mine clearing duty with knives, have fun. Or, you know, wire replacement. The movie shows how fraught that was. <laughs> yeah. But it's it, the, it's like the, the movie just wants you to really, really know communism is bad. And kind of like we were talking with the Patriot. Okay. Well, they're not given ammo. Hey, audience, communism's bad. All right, now they're sent across the open field. Hey, audience, communism's bad. Now we're shooting our own dudes. Now the commander who ordered the attack and failed has to shoot himself because Khrushchev's there. Now, because yeah, of the propaganda, Vasily Zaitsev's getting hunted. And it's like, and now Zaitsev is getting hunted because you put his face out there too much. And so that's the, the movie just, oh, and they show, now this one's accurate, that the Soviets wouldn't let the civilians leave Stalingrad. That one's accurate, but it yeah. just, over and over, they're telling you how bad the communists are. And it's insulting, because at one point, they have the sniper played by uh, Ron Perlis, uh, Kulikov. He literally tells the story about how, like, he was trained at a German military academy, and when he came back, he was accused of being a traitor, and they knocked out his teeth. I loved his character. And so he, he he gives it, – it's so good. And I don't even bring that up in the review because, like, that was a thing. In the purges, Soviet citizens who had German or Polish backgrounds or had worked with the Germans and the Poles, even if the government had asked them to, especially with the Germans, they were targeted in the purges. Like, that part is accurate. But if you're going to have that – why do you have to, you know, I basically say in my review, why make up massacres and make up brutality when it already existed? Plenty of examples. Like yeah. you're dealing with a total, yeah, you're dealing with a totalitarian regime and you make them look worse than they were. Like why? You don't have to play with the history. Like let it speak for itself. So I just, that movie... But like you said, I still like it. It's still a guilty pleasure of mine. Yeah. I watch it about once a year. Guilty pleasure is a great way to describe it. It's just, I wish I wish they would have gotten the history a little more correct. You know, I think I might have a bit of information that you might not have touched upon. And I only found this by accident when I was making my own piece. I, I did a video on um, famous uh, Soviet women, uh, some snipers as well. Mm -hmm. And the most famous uh, woman, uh, she's all over YouTube, it's uh, Ludmila Pavlinenchko. Uh, she was the female sniper who got the most kills. It was uh, 309 confirmed. And it is Zaitsev had a confirmed uh, 225, I believe. This film's about Zaitsev. And it's about him fighting a German sniper who he calls 
uh, Erwin Koning. And I read into mm -hmm. this because I it fell upon my lap when I was looking her up. Zaitsev's uh, story about this guy, it only comes from him. And most scholars say that he made this up. And it's a fictitious story because they have no records on either side of this character. But he resembles one person. And it's a fake character that was sent after Ludmilla when she was sniping. They called him Otto von Singer. And this character wasn't real. It was mm -hmm. German propaganda. They said he had like 500 kills because, you know, everyone was making up numbers to make their side look better. But I found it interesting then looking back at this film. I don't know the personal story of Zaitsev, but I'm wondering with the female snipers in his battalion, is this actually the story of Zaitsev or is this the story of uh, Ludmila? Because I'm wondering now if it was actually... That's entirely her. plausible because even looking at some of Zaitsev's own writings, I think he said the longest duel he ever had with a German sniper was like three days. Yeah, three days. And the account I... Yeah, and the account I've seen of it is way less remarkable than this duel with the German super sniper. So I wonder if you're right that somehow those stories just got merged. And Zaitsev is more of a household name, so we're like, oh, it's more interesting, let's take him because he's more household. Let's merge him with her story because his writing is actually kind of boring. Yeah, I, I think honestly... We gotta, we gotta make it sexier. Yeah, and I, I think it was interesting because they show... I, I don't know exactly, because I can't remember the movie, what the premises was for the female snipers around him, but there were some. It, it, it's as if, yeah, maybe they were merging the stories because I, I would grant you both stories are interesting, both characters, but I mean, Ludvilia was arguably much more successful. She went to the White House and toured after, and she did get more confirmed kills. But this idea that there's mm -hmm. a kind of a fictitious German sniper, both of them have this story, and both seem to be just propaganda by the Germans, actually, just trying to make it seem like they had someone in their pocket. This Erwin Koenig, also, his name is actually more Dutch than German, so I, I really think Zaitsev made this up. Maybe Zaitsev did have, I, I'm sure, because he, he did kill a lot of snipers. He had a great story, but I think it was a propaganda piece that the uh, Soviets told him to say. I just, I don't know, looking at his own memoirs, it, it's like, I don't even think it was a paragraph. He talks about a three-day duel with a sniper who was kind of smarter than the average bear. Mm -hmm. And that was it. I, I just don't know where this... But then it gets put into other novels, like there's uh, Rotten Creek, War of the Rats... And it's, you know, the author says he based it a lot on Enemy at the Gates and cites his own writings, but then they change his name too. And in that one, it's uh, Heinz Torvald. So then they give the super sniper a different name. And it's just, it's so interesting how mythologized history gets. Yeah, no, like definitely. That. I, that, that is the, the trope of history, especially when you get to ancient sources, it's imbued with people who didn't know the events so they lie about it and then people believe those lies and it gets like broken telephoned and then things get made up but people take you gotta it love realistic. thucydides although at least thucydides <laughs> he says like oh i wasn't there for these speeches so here's the best recollection i can do so i at least give thucydides credit that he points out that he's making stuff up herodotus doesn't get any love a lot of them don't <laughs> herodotus the father of lies that's the the greatest uh, yeah. tag. I I mean a lot of my background. I did a lot of the classics because I I just really liked ancient Greece and uh, Rome. So a lot of my background is with that, and it's I I just love the image of these people writing about events 400 years before them as if they knew what was going on and just making it up on the spot. You know what they won because the version that seventh graders get is basically the Herodotus and the Thucydides version, even down to the numbers for like Marathon and stuff. They they haven't adjusted those numbers too much. Yep. And I talk about this in the other episode of the podcast, but I actually had a student ask and say, how do we even know these numbers? Are they true? And I basically had to be like, no, probably not. Like, why would you ask a general to estimate the numbers of people in a battle? Of course, a general is going to lie to make themselves sound better and then a historian how, how are they going to vet that if they weren't there yeah that's very true but where else do we get numbers like <laughs> it's it's true we have no way of knowing we it's just archaeology basically is the only thing we got and it can only go so far 
how interested you are in how they fought, but like if you read recent literature, we don't even know how they fought, really. Yeah. Like I've even seen arguments. If you look at Greek pottery, sometimes phalanx, you know, the the hoplites are shown holding the spear underhand, and sometimes they're shown holding it overhand. So like we don't even know how they held the spear. My favorite piece of research, particularly in the phalanxes is the universities that went out of their way to get all the equipment made and to try and reenactment to see what would be feasible it honestly that was the best way of going about it because a lot of the research that they did they kind of figured out that most of the um scholars that were talking about the way phalanxes worked was just untrue because it just didn't make sense so modern mm -hmm. research has gone a long way especially uh, i remember there was someone who recreated a, a treyame boat and figured out how many oars and how it was supposed to work and that we've been wrong this entire time about how fast these things would go and how they would be used so there's interesting tactics on how to that figure it out i have to update myself on them because when when we talked about the Peloponnesian war and again like we still did the traditional they rammed each other and sheared oars so i gotta look into that but yeah, for battlefields, there's now the impulse theory because you look at the ancient sources and they tell you that these guys fought for like 12 hours in some cases, like sun up to sundown, <laughs> and then only 10% of them died. And most of the ones who died, died in retreat. And you think about it, you're like, could they really be, you know, the way Hollywood portrays it, like standing in a line, stabbing and fighting as hard as they can for 12 hours and only 10% die? Like that doesn't add up. Um, and it doesn't add up that people wouldn't get tired. So now we have impulse theory where they would take breaks and cycle units. And that, that seems to make way more sense. I, my friend, because I, I don't uh, specialize. Medieval ages, I'm not very good at. My friend specialized in that. And he was telling me there was a specific research article on how uh, French knights fought. And it was really, it, it kind of clarified that question. There would be three knights in a squad. And two of the knights would hold up their shields, they would take the blunts of the hits, and one knight would fight until he was fatigued for just a few minutes, and then they would, you know, cycle. Because that's mm -hmm. true, you, your fatigue level when you're fighting these combat situations, it's impossible. Twelve, if they were doing a battle for 12 hours, let's say at the, uh, I don't know, something in Alexander's time, Battle of Ipsis, yeah, if they're in a phalanx, so like certain people would take up for a few minutes, and I imagine then they would cycle with other people, and both sides would be doing this, because you just, you would be you'd be done. <laughs> hmm. You know, reading impulse theory, it makes so much more sense to me that you would, you would fight as hard as you could for like maybe five minutes, then pull back and talk about each other's mothers and throw your missile weapons. And <laughs> yeah. in a lot of ancient accounts, skirmishers are written a lot about, and that would make way more sense that you're just, no one wants to actually die. So you hurl some spears, you yell some insults, then you fight back off, rotate, yeah, definitely. Um, looking at the list that we kind of came up with for movies, I don't, what, what do you feel like touching upon? We could go into 300. Right, my, my internet kind of turned you into a robot for a minute. Oh, did it? What was that? Oh, I was wondering, with the kind of... Yeah. loose list we have on the movies we were thinking about talking about would you like to move on i guess like 300 is kind of close to what we're talking about now as long as we're talking about ancient warfare <laughs> we can definitely bring up 300 oh man that's everyone's favorite historical inaccurate film isn't it it's a it's a masterpiece yeah i can't talk about the greeks without my students especially the female students thinking about 300 and getting flustered <laughs> and i have to remind them like no actually they wore lots of armor that's kind of what made oh. a hoplite formidable they weren't just deflecting arrows go. with their cod pieces and their six packs or their 12 packs as the movie portrays them they're they're not bare chested i'm i'm, I'm surprised it's almost as if they're fighting a war <laughs> And that's oh the movie too. We had to talk about this a lot. Like it I don't know your thoughts, but isn't that really out of fashion to portray it as this east west battle for civilization? And if Greece falls, then white people are done. Like it's... I was kind of surprised that 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 made it into a movie that's so recent. I, I, the only way I can sum it up is I remember I can't remember when it came out. I think I was 13 years old. The movie Kingdom of Heaven came to theaters. And on the poster, it said, 
good versus evil, Christian versus Muslim on the poster. And from watching 300, you just just look at how the Persians are monster pig people, some of them. Uh, they're chain whipping their people into fighting. It's just, it's Ogres! So, yeah, it's just so <laughs> blatant. I mean... <laughs> and the immortals are actually like faceless monsters. Oh, I love that. They're, um... The immortals are something out of, I don't know, Lord of the Rings almost. It's incredible. The <laughs> Yeah. And Xerxes. He's I think, what was it? Like... I'm sorry, you're going to have some clicking noise. I got to look up the year for the movie 300. I want to say it came out early in college. Oh, I God. was in undergrad. 2006, yeah, so I would have just started university. Oh, here. Oh, just give me when one it second. Actually aired. I actually own a parrot and it is making noises. I'll be right back. One sec. <laughs> Okay, back. Sorry about that. People are so I, probably going to be really entertained by the fact there's a parrot literally in the video. <laughs> Didn't have the parrot in the video. I yeah. enjoy that. He's in the background. Good, <laughs> good verbs. Good um, no, I'm really interested now because I looked up, like, I don't know if you're substantially younger or older than I am, but I'm 31. So, like, yeah, Kingdom of Heaven... I remember that being not too long after uh, 2001. So it definitely makes sense that it would be couched in that sort of view in the West. Um, oh, God. Can you imagine putting that movie out today with that poster? <laughs> no, that would be, yeah. that'd be totally different. Yeah, so the release date started between, in the US, this movie came in 2007. So you'd think that's be that'd be far enough away from 9-11 that these tropes wouldn't be in there but the the graphic novel was written in 1998 and i don't know i don't maybe i was too young i was only 10 years old in 98 but i don't remember there being so much focus on east versus west at the time like enough years had passed since the gulf, first gulf war and we hadn't had the second gulf war yet or afghanistan or 9 11. well you so know i'm really shocked to see this east west dynamic I mean, because all the ancient sources you, from ours that we would use, you know, in the classic as Westerners, they're always you know, mm -hmm. West versus East. It's always played out that way. When you actually learn real Persian history, it's mind boggling how different it is and how the events like especially 300. The Greeks are the bad guys kind of in this <laughs> and especially the Spartans who are fighting. I, I'm not going to say they use the word democracy, but it's blatant like they're fighting for liberty and they're the biggest slave owners in the world at this point it's kind of ridiculous like their entire society yeah and then the athenians are always the heroes and the democrats and then people neglect that after the persian wars athens had an empire and they can call it a delian league like they can do that sure and they do in their sources but it was definitely the athenian empire yeah for sure like there's no doubt about it and Persia, like, you know, at least this part's making it into American textbooks now. Like, Persia was, how do I say this? For the times, Persia was a pretty chill empire. Like, certainly nowadays, I don't think it would be viewed thusly, but oh, God, no. for back then, like, if you shut up and paid your taxes and donated your troops... That was one of the more relaxed empires you could have over you for the times. Multiple different peoples of different origins were under their empire being treated uh, relatively equal as long as, like you said, you paid your tribute, brought your soldiers up. Even Greeks in Ionia, which mm -hmm. is the precursor to this entire film that they failed to acknowledge because it would defeat the purpose of, oh, the Greeks attacked the Persians first and that's why they came here. <laughs> they never mentioned that. It's, uh, it's glossed over pretty heavily. Mm -hmm. That and, I mean, the obvious tropes that everyone, I think, already knows at this point is it wasn't like 2 million Persians against 300 Spartans by themselves. This is, like, so ridiculous. They, uh, the Spartans had... These were just the rear guard. 
Yeah, they had about what five? I think modern scholars are given low numbers, five thousand. Greek forces, different Greek city states, Arcadians, uh, Corinthians, even Thespians. I always find that funny. Thespians are involved because they're kind of the, let's say, the mm -hmm. most hated Greek group. Always side with the Persians. And uh, man, what else to say about this movie? There's so much wrong, and everyone already knows it. Uh, even the depiction of uh, the traitor, the uh, Ifaltes, I think that's how you pronounce his name. He's depicted as this horrifying mm -hmm. humpback monster. I mean, I understand from a Greek standpoint that they want to really demonize him because he was the guy that sold them out. But he didn't, there's no reason to believe he was some horrid looking monster. He was just a guy that got paid off. No, as far as I understood in actual history, he was just a farmer who found a way to make a buck. But in the movie, they have to remind you because the Spartans are so weird and mystical and whatever. Hey, the Spartans abandoned their children, but one of one of them survived. Yeah. And yeah. I don't I don't remember ever reading that that was a survivor of the Spartan abandonment policies. I think they just wanted a chance like they had to show an oracle in the film they had to anything they could do to mystify the spartans as these crazy warrior you know this warrior race yeah i think they were going to do even though the real history is less sexy like yeah I was a farmer you know they didn't care what conflict did he have with the persians if they renamed this movie herodotus presents the battle of thermopylae i think it would be accurate it's a lot closer to the ancient sources just kind of mythicizing and making it a fantastic drama. And yeah. That, even the, the way that uh, but that's... Leonidas and Xerxes speak, it, it's really strong on the ancient sources. Like, the dialogue's pretty close there. Mm-hmm. You know, the students, my students laugh about this is Sparta and kicking into the well, but, like, I'm pretty sure Herodotus tells that story... The we will fight in the shade, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure was Herodotus. The yeah. we won't lay down our weapons, come take them was Herodotus. So I think you're right that a lot of the dialogue is based. And when Xerxes isn't like looking like a real god, like some of the interactions were closer. But the problem is, you know, like you say, if you call it Herodotus, you know, <laughs> Herodotus presents completely unedited. <laughs> from the Athenian and Spartan version that's totally biased 300 like it'd be fine but some people will watch this and go oh my gosh well I'm glad the Greeks won so white people still exist because they as this like, film does portray yeah. they defended everyone and the Persians didn't topple over them burn Athens twice and then move on to do war in the Persian Empire because Greece was so unimportant, and this was such a minor incident for Persia that didn't matter in the great <laughs> history of things. This was kind of a side tour for them. But for us in Greece, it's like we're the, we're the center of the world, and this is the defining moment for Western civilization. <laughs> it's actually hilarious. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh for greece if not for greece standing strong how could alexander the great spread hellenism which is basically what a seventh grader in america needs to know about alexander the great i would like that's you know there's a whole chapter about him but that's the that's the thing that gets on tests is he spread hellenism let's look at alexandria okay oh boy and you know people if people want to yeah. hear me i don't know if you've seen my youtube channel but i started this youtube channel just personally attacking alexander for three videos so <laughs> watch those ones because i haven't seen the movie yet but i think i might just watch them because apparently it's disappeared from netflix so i'm not gonna oh, not yeah? gonna get it anyway it's um gone and i was gonna watch troy and laugh at it too and both of those oh are... my god troy Oh, somewhere brad pitt and troy <laughs> oh boy <laughs> alexander is uh it's an interesting film it was made by oliver stone he's actually pretty good at these things but <sighs> alexander's story is just so full of lies uh, the asian scholars were it's mm -hmm. a huge propaganda piece so i don't blame him for depicting the movie the way he did it's actually it's not bad because the one thing I'll give to, Al to Oliver Stone is he depicted Alexander as a mopey, alcoholic, 
very overly emotional person because all the scholars that had the credible information on him point out that Alexander was prone to the most unbelievable emotional outbursts. Whenever his men would not do something, he locked himself in his tent and cried for three days. <laughs> and this is hmm. the great Macedonian uh, guy who was leading all the charges. Sure, he was. Because he was um, particularly great in war. I'd have to tactically, he's a fantastic. We should know him as Alexander the Great. And a lot of these battles that he won, it was unbelievable. Mm. The movie does a great job of uh, showing the tactics. The weapons are great. The the formations are awesome. The only problem is they actually merged three of his greatest battles into one battle for the movie. And I I understand it's a film. We can't uh, show all of them. But uh, it really diminished yeah. kind of the point that Alexander was chasing, for people who don't know this, this man who was the leader of Persia, Darius, or Darius, depending if you're British or not. And uh, he chased him throughout mm-hmm. three, three different battles, and Darius had to retreat each time until uh, his own people actually killed him, and Alexander was really sad by this. But the movie just, it's one battle, and it's, it's a great-looking battle. It's amazing, but it really diminishes his story that and the questions uh, the movie really dabbles in the question of sexuality for alexander and it's it's really an easy thing to portray he it was ancient greece if he had sexual relations with men Mm -hmm. it just was for fun he did have three wives and at least one kid if i remember correctly i think he died though afterwards and uh, what else about the movie? I had a little bit of notes written here. Uh, the movie stance on his mother, because that's yeah. the other thing, talking yeah. about Alexander and like, you know, how did Philip die? And I tell this to him, like, honestly, we don't know. <laughs> Here's what a lot of people say. I have no clue. I've read 15 versions. Like, so what, what did the movie come down on his mother? It's interesting because the movie places the blame on his mother, but not him. He, uh, He's completely shocked, and he even looks at his mom, and you know she looks like a, a demon cultist. As we know in ancient history, she was actually a very crazy person who was into snakes, and they really do a great job of showing Angelina mm-hmm. Jolie in this way. But they made it seem like she was independent killing Philip, whereas more evidence, honestly, I, I've read so much. I really kind of... I'm at the point, I believe Alexander did it, because Philip was estranged by Alexander at this point, and he was marrying uh, another wife again. And um, Alexander isn't fully blooded Macedonian. His mom wasn't. So the next heir Hmm. in that woman's belly was going to be fully Macedonian. And incidentally, after Philip was killed, that that woman and that son were killed too, immediately by Olympias, the the mom. So it's all too coincidental. Alexander, he was getting pushed out of the throne, and he was at the perfect age to take over, I guess he thought. It, it all fell into part uh, way too well. And not to mention, the guy that kills his father is killed by two people who are friends of Alexander. It's something the ancient scholars point out all the time, that these two guys killed the guy before he could speak. It's a little odd. Mm-hmm. So the movie, I, I, yeah. you know, I tell my students that part. I'm like, well, the assassin would never was able to talk, so we'll never know. But that that's interesting. I hadn't seen as much evidence that he was about to lose out on the dynastic politics. And so he would definitely have a uh, have a stake in doing it, too. Well, when it comes down to it in Macedonian culture this time, you know, Macedonians were, were we're not Greek. Let's just say that much. Like you would not associate them as mm. being the same thing. They're the Ubermensch of <laughs> the race of Greeks. They're the the top dogs. So if Alexander was half Macedonian, and you had a full blooded Macedonian from a wife you like, because Olympias at this point, uh, Philip really didn't like her. He was terrified of her. The the whole snake cultist thing was getting to him, and his relationship with Alexander was also strained when Alexander was uh, showing more of his, I want to call it allegiance to his mom. The mom was feeding Alexander, you know, the whole thing of, uh, you weren't born from Philip, you know, you're the son of Zeus and all this. And it's shown in the film. And in history, Alexander, you know, he made up this 
whole thing where he had to go to a, an oracle to prove that he actually was descended from Zeus and he was a god and that was the whole trying to be mm -hmm. a god thing in ancient culture I mean Philip did the same thing everyone in Greek did that in Greece did that the film uh, places the blame all on the mom but I mean if you're looking at it and you're a detective I would put it I would put my finger at Alexander too I wouldn't say he was independent of all this and it's, it's all too it's too convenient like when I explain it to students and maybe I'm being inaccurate but I tell them I'm like now did he really believe it or was he doing it for a method of control I tell them like it's impossible to tell we'll never know like obviously ancient people were very religious and it was politically advantageous to claim to be a god or descended from a god Everyone as a method it. of control Every single Greek ruler pretty much did yeah. this. Ptolemy tried to... Everyone after Alexander, all of his generals, they did the same thing. They tried to cling to some notion that they descended from Heracles or Zeus in some way or some other god. Like Everyone had to have a backstory that brought you from divinity. And Alexander was no different than everyone mm -hmm. before him. Whether he believed it or not, it didn't matter. It was, yeah, just like you said, maybe just for control. And, you know... the weird... you have, like, the idea of divine right and, yeah. you know divine bloodlines and like european the middle ages and yeah exactly even before that with the sumerians and like the different city states of uh sumer you have the kings and the priestesses often had very close ties sometimes outright relationships because crowns understood very early on in human history that to have religion on your side was effective and you know, are there egomaniacs and narcissists? Like, definitely. And he could have been that. But I also explained to them, like, this has been a method of control for human governments for thousands of years. And like you say, even contemporaneously and just after, this was still the template to follow. Yeah. Oh, whoops, one sec. Accidentally put some volume there because I have YouTube clips in the background showing the movies. Okay, I fixed it. Uh, you know, other than that, uh, the only thing I could uh, throw on top of the film, uh, the film has one of the end battles. It's uh, when he's finally getting towards India, and it's the battle of Hydaspes. Oh, God, I always I don't think I pronounced it right. Hydaspes, Hydaspes, and he uh, he fights the Indian king. And in the movie, they have it as if the um, the Indian forces injure him, and this kind of leads on to his death, and that he has sustained a big injury. Whereas I'd say unanimously through my research and a lot of recent articles are really trying to pit the idea that he died of alcoholism. And the movie alludes to it really well. Like Oliver Stone doesn't give you a good idea of what killed him, but it's like one of the end scenes is him literally drinking and then collapsing and grabbing his chest. So hmm. I, I thought that was a good idea. Away from poison. They think it was just normal well, alcohol poisoning. You see, with the thing where, you know, I'm sure you're well-versed in ancient Greece, they love poisons and dramas. Like, I know a few mm -hmm. ancient sources played, you know, which general killed him, and I've heard stories from more contemporary modern scholars saying that he might have died from dysentery. I thought that was interesting. In my original YouTube video, that's what I put in the end it towards, because I, I couldn't honestly tell people, like, no one knows. Alcoholism, dysentery, poison, mm -hmm. they're all great possibilities. Maybe one of his uh, mm -hmm. lover, maybe one of his lovers did it because I mean I know his first wife wasn't too fond of him in the end. That's the what I say is I'm like was he injured? Did he have malaria? Was it alcohol? And if he was poisoned, was it his male lover and jealousy? What is his wives being jealous of his male lover? Was it you know yeah. revenge for the fall of the Persian Empire? Like there's so many versions. I just tell them I'm like we'll never know. And uh, I mean. This is off topic, but the the greatest thing to mention is he died at the pivotal moment. If he didn't die, what would have happened? Mm -hmm. You couldn't know there was no unification. They all took their own empires, made the Hellenistic Empire period, and then everything crumbled so Rome could come and clean it up. It's, uh... But I don't, you know, once he had been stopped at India, and this is kind of just those fun hypotheticals where we stop being historians and we be fans of history. Like, <laughs> was it just an empire based on conquest? Once he gets turned back from India, like, even if he'd lived, would he have been able to hold it together much longer anyway? 
I and I just know. wonder that because I would say he was going to get that, killed that. by one of his generals for sure. Yeah, or like, hey, you know, all right, we're not. I mean, the army wasn't happy to have defeats, and they certainly weren't happy to be in India. They were ready to go home. The Macedonians were the ones particularly writing about how much they hated his cosmopolitan-like behavior and how he would, and you know, wear Persian clothes, make friends with the enemies, as they would say it, and, you know, adopt so many things. These Macedonians weren't even cool with him being with the Greeks. You know, everything needed to be Macedonian and pure, and we're the original group, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And Alexander, you know, mm -hmm. really an interesting character. The one thing I would give him is he was really cosmopolitan. It seems like he understood he needed to adopt different cultures to get them underneath his foot, which worked, you know, in Persian. Yeah. In the Persian Empire, that's how it worked. You know, you had to adopt a lot of different people and you had to play a little bit nice and just get your tribute. And they'll probably revolt when they can, but that's inevitable. Yeah, that's the version uh, we teach in middle schools now is that whether he was doing it because he was truly cosmopolitan deep down or whether you think cynically he was doing it for control that he was very adept at borrowing and respecting other cultures and that helped hold the empire together despite its multicultural and multi-ethnic nature <laughs> yeah I, I, you know I, i'd have to say the film did a good part in uh, the cosmopolitan multicultural part uh, a lot of the scenes, it just shows Macedonians just scowling at him as old friends, like looking at him like in disgust as he's dancing with Persian guys or the uh, the Indians. And I, I'd imagine, yeah, that's actually from the ancient sources. That's exactly how it was. And when he killed, for instance, his uh, friend Cletus, that scene was almost completely mm. the same as I read it from ancient sources. I really liked how that went down. Um. Did you have a and stuff? Did you have a pick for next movie or? Um, I mean, I am up for whatever we can do. Downfall. I. It's been a while since I've seen Pearl Harbor. Yeah, so I I'm know. interesting. I uh... like where <laughs> you would come on the historical side, other than just man, a Michael Bay movie is sure an experience. Oh boy, dude. Okay, well, how about we quickly go? <laughs> Oh, Pearl Harbor. I, I have to admit, it's the same thing. I haven't seen it in a long time, so I had to just, oh my god, spruce up on this this catastrophe of the film. Uh, I think it's unanimous. This film is just... <laughs> yeah. When I when I have my Pearl Harbor fix, I just watch Tora, Tora, Tora again. That's Now you see, that's the movie that everyone you know, that's says me. is extremely historically accurate, and it's a fantastic film. And you look at... Why was Pearl the, Harbor made? The only thing it gets wrong... Yeah, the only thing I think it gets wrong is I don't think the Sleeping Giant quote ever happened. The one I've been able to find is that instead of saying, I fear we've awakened a sweet Sleeping Giant and filled him with a terrible resolve, the actual quote I've seen, which is almost creepier and more interesting, at least to me, which is, we can run wild for six months, but after that we'll be facing terrible retribution or something like that. Yeah, like I... it gave a six month time frame. And what's really weird is six months from that day, I'm pretty sure it's around six months where you have midway and the war is getting ready to start shifting. Like it was really prophetic and strange. And I think that's more interesting, but the sleeping giant seems to have been the, uh, what, what history has selected to. Yeah. I've, I've read actually into. both, both quotes that you mentioned. I, I've read, uh, people arguing about this and I, I i've read more on the side that the sleeping giant was just something that was kind of dramatized it's not true the other one that you're mentioning because he had calculated mm -hmm. the six month uh, period yeah it, it's absolutely true in his memoirs and everything was written about this that's how it went down so i would imagine the whole sleeping giant is kind of just something that and in, in english if it sounds that good you have to question it because this is in japanese like it doesn't make I honestly, I don't believe it either. Mm -hmm. uh, but six yeah. months. I don't get why that's not more interesting. Because it was like six months. Like he calculated that perfectly. Here, let me. Uh... Yeah, it was definitely sure calculated. I'm not I mean, he didn't want to do it in the first place. They, they fourth him... through seventh. So you know, December seventh to June. 
just barely over six months. Like that's nuts. Yep. Predict that 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 was the capability of Japanese strength, and by then the um, industrial capacity of the U.S. would have risen up. Like, <laughs> I think that's more interesting than the Sleeping Giant. Yeah, it definitely but, is. You know what do I know? Wait, it's I don't like, work it's in Hollywood. So foreshadowing, Maybe that's why. I guess the whole Sleeping Giant thing. It's really foreshadowing. Makes for a great quote. Yeah. Really... Oh boy, how to even touch think... this movie? <laughs> I don't think Hollywood likes uh, industrial capacity and logistics, even though that that really is such a big deciding factor in wars. United States it's not really fun to portray. The United States productivity won them the war. It was the, the engine started rolling. That's how it went. And the Japanese were not completely ignorant of how that was going to play out, but they didn't foresee how oh my god how productivity was going to play out like that because they did like, statistically what it went up three hundred and fifty percent or something. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. What could Japan do? And that's the reason they did Pearl Harbor in the first place is the oil embargo because they needed oil to fuel their empire. They just didn't have it. Like, and I don't ever want to do like presentism and teleological study and say, well, they were always going to lose because we can't say that with certainty. But like, if you have to pick a fight to try to get rid of an oil embargo, to wage an industrial like 20th century conflict you're not in a great position yeah i had a and obviously the u.s <laughs> went the other way i had an excellent professor uh, at uh, well i went to the university of concordia and he does uh, japanese history and he does specifically the pacific war he's um he's a uh, actually he's not is he canadian i think he might be from british columbia but he might be american but he lived in japan for 10 years and his wife's Japanese and he teaches the Pacific War as unbiased as he can and all the sources on the Japanese side about how they were theoretically going about this war you look at it and all the major uh, admirals in the Navy they knew what they were getting into if they were to fight the United States they all knew this was doom and the army wanted mm -hmm. to you know press into Manchuko but unfortunately the Russians had really repelled them and Stalin, you know, withheld a lot of troops to protect that area. So they had either the army's choice or the navy's choice. And to get funding, if you're in the navy or if you're in the army, you have to do something. So the navy were like, we want funding. So they chose to pretty much go into a suicide almost. They thought maybe, you know, when they're projecting, yeah, six months, we take all the islands, we get the oil, and then we make this war as unbelievably horrible so the Americans give up. Yeah, I can I can see some rationale in that, but a lot of the like, a lot of the high tier guys were like, it's not gonna work. United States, because they had studied in the United States, they saw what productive like what, you know, Ford assembly lines could produce, and Japan was nowhere like this. You know, they could barely produce compared mm -hmm. to the United States in numbers wise. I mean, sure the Japanese made ex excellent the Yamato and everything, unbelievable, but it's a few ships. The United States completely just flopped over them with the numbers. Not to mention the mm -hmm. amount of the Air Force, the bombing, and uh, the advantageous uh, radar systems eventually used completely destroyed the kamikaze attacks. The Japanese had no no chance in hell. It was, uh, it was a fly hitting a bear. <laughs> like you say, all the engineering prowess in the world, like, you know, you, you can geek out about the specs of a zero, but if you don't have enough of them, I, yeah, I love that argument. What does it mean in the end? Yeah, the Zero, everyone uh, who knows their planes, like the Zero was unbelievable. It's undeniable, probably the best plane. I think it's been argued in the war. But yeah, how many did they have? And the United States aircraft carriers, I... you know, they had a lot more planes that could get off the aircraft carriers than the Japanese did. The Japanese didn't have anything by the end, so it's just, there's no hope. It's about pilot you can't just throw any soldier into a plane you need trained and highly skilled pilots and the longer the war went on japan could not replace their pilots fast enough not with men that needed the type of skills to be effective in that sort of warfare no and uh i don't know if people are too knowledgeable of the real history behind the kamikaze pilots by the end of the war they were putting guns in these people's heads and said, yeah, your family is going to go through rough times if you don't get in this plane on a kamikaze mission. So the planes were not even up to standard. They were just things that would go off and never return with 
fuel added to them so they can blow up better. Good pivot point. But that's one of the things I liked about the movie Letters from Iwo Jima, talking about the propaganda and like with the radio broadcast of even the little kids singing, you know, showing the men like, hey, you have families back home and we are kind of watching them right now. And what are you going to do? Do you want to disappoint this little kid singing that you're the last bastion of hope? Like, it was really interesting for how it brought that home front and how it tried to explain what would create this ethos of, you know, death before dishonor and how much of that was baked in the culture versus how much of that was coercion versus how much of that was just a steady dose of propaganda. I know you can't see uh, my webcam, but I, I did have books I had on the side, and I just put this here by random, but I have here this book. It's, uh, well, where's my cam? The Battle for Okinawa. It was written by um, Colonel Hiromichi Yahara, who is in charge of uh, the Okinawa campaign. Mm. And it's interesting read from the, ja it's one of the few good ones from the Japanese point of view, because he's kind of, he's putting some propaganda to make himself look better. But you read, you know, a classic American literature by um, uh, what, what became the the Pacific and HBO, uh, Eugene Sledge's novel, uh, The Old Breed, which, you know, gives you a real look mm -hmm. into what it was like to be a U.S. Marine in the Pacific War. Both these books touch the exact same battle, and they link up well, and both characters are seen in both novels, because uh, Yahara was taken as a prisoner at the end, and Sledge was a witness to this. And I find it interesting, especially in America, in American literature, for the longest time, the idea of these Japanese being fanatics and they're, you know, classified as zombies who mm -hmm. bonsai charge. It's not completely true. Like, sure, they did do these suicide attacks, but by the end of the war, especially in Okinawa, what surprised the Americans is when they stormed the beaches, they weren't they weren't initially attacked. The Japanese withdrew. Mm -hmm waited let the americans come in and then bombarded them with a different more war of attrition attack which was uh interesting anyways i'm getting off topic it was a, it was a thing i had to read in uh, university but uh our depictions of japanese in this war are quite wrong from our western standpoint we need to read more eastern literature because it's, it's dramatically different it gives you more of an outlook as to why they did some of the horrible horrible things that they did because my god the japanese oof did a lot of bad things <laughs> you know i like that you bring up uh sledge and uh lecky was the other big one mm. for uh you know I, have you seen the pacific the yeah. mini series on hbo yeah it draws heavily from those two memoirs but like sledge's book and i just recently went through and reread it man it's so raw and it's interesting that like you say it, it's not as just the japanese are fanatics like he shows like you know through his eyes and again is he making stuff up it's hard to tell with memoirs but like how the marines would pry the gold teeth out of still living soldiers yeah. and like slash their cheeks to get you know, even in the miniseries, the Pacific, like showing a dude having like dysentery on an ammo can and like just that <laughs> real raw, nasty side of war and how there were definitely. And I got to like watch how I frame this because I've seen comment sections of YouTube turn into the uh, kind of the massacre Olympics and the war crime Olympics and who was worse. But like, did you see just my showing video? how brutal it got? By any chance, did you see my video? What happened to me? I I unfortunately I did, and I saw your ratio, and I saw some of the comments, and I was like, "Oh my god!" Yeah, no, I understand it. I, yeah, talking about the skull collections, and people went way off the rails. I had to delete all the. I had to delete for the people who wrote them, but I had people writing, like, like it was like those yellow monkey gooks had it coming. I'm glad my grandfather peeled the meat off a guy's skull and took it home. I'm like. You, you wrote that as a comment openly in the public, like, oh my god, dude. Um, so I had to delete most of them, but I understand why Americans don't want to hear this kind of stuff, because I wouldn't either. You know, Canadians, because uh, I'm mm. Canadian, we were responsible for a lot of war crimes in World War One. People don't talk about it. Our officers would just shoot POW Germans because of grievances. 
and you're not supposed to do that, and it was horrible stuff. Mm. But you know, just because the Japanese are probably the number one winner of the atrocity award in the world, doesn't mean that U.S. soldiers couldn't do some bad things too. And I mean, I didn't, I, I don't know, I how bad I made the video, honestly. But I thought I had said multiple times, I'm not blaming the United States of America. Like these are a few guys. It's not like everybody took a skull home. And then Very I yeah. fair, and there were people in the comments denying it, even though you had like pictures, which really uh, that that was interesting. Like people in the comments, like, well, <sighs> no, but you see, well, actually, it's like, no, did you actually watch the video? Like, there's picture and diary documentation. Time magazine. It's one of the probably closest, pretty credible if you have those two sources. And the only reason why I made this video is because my professor, uh, oh, I can see him, he's a public figure, Matthew Panny, the, he, he did an entire segment on this uh, when he was teaching us. And it's an interesting topic because all these skulls, they're being sent back to Japan to this day because these families that have them in their closets are like, I feel horrible. I want to find the family. I want to give it back. So, you know, like, I'm not going to just throw dirt on the americans who did this like a lot of things have been done to you know undo the shame but the only reason i really did this is my professor pointed this out when you look at the pacific war and then you look at world war ii in europe we just don't see a bunch of nazi skulls being brought home we just don't see italian skulls being brought home that's kind of the point i was making i was like mm -hmm. there was we all know there was a racial darkness to this war and look at the propaganda you know, Australians, Canadians, Americans, we all put out the images of them as monkeys and all this stuff. And I was just poking at that. And I honestly, I, I get it because, wow, the comments on YouTube were bad, but the ones on Reddit were much worse that I got. I got I got wrecked for that video. Saying yeah. it wasn't accurate or people just saying, well, baton happened, so this was fine. Uh, I there was a lot of that, too. Two, two arguments. The, they're the only two arguments that come up in the hundreds was... This did not happen. Uh, you're disgusting for saying this because Americans never do anything wrong. And then the other argument was because the Japanese did this, they did this. So fuck you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Shouldn't swear on this video. But yeah, like uh, they were just demonetized. Yeah. yeah. They would just throw like, <laughs> oh, you know, Japan um, unit seven. I think it's seven, eight, seven or whatever did those atrocities. Uh, rape and nine. Yeah. Yeah, of course, the Rape and Nine King. I, I, at no point, I think I even mentioned the Japanese did a lot worse. And the Rape and Nine King happened, and we should all remember. I, At no point am I apologetic for the Japanese. I mean, they were beating their own soldiers. Like, the Americans think they were stressed out. The Japanese, their high command was treated them worse than the Soviets sometimes. They were beaten up, put into... <laughs> it was horrible. thing with enemy at the gates like oh if they just used primary sources from soviets after man you could show conditions being so bad you don't have to just show them getting machine gunned down like there are so many primary sources that say we never had artillery we never had recon like the suicide charge if the men were shown trying to be smart going across the field and not have the officers shooting at them from their back I promised artillery and air power and recon and they didn't get it but like sorry i'm just back to ranting <laughs> no it seems like did you get some backlash when you did that review i get backlash from a lot of my soviet stuff from both sides i had huh. a lot of the people say that i'm wrong and it was like that and i'm being an apologist um oh i got the same thing from my soviet my soviet video with the female snipers and i made it like pretty much a almost a, in the terms of feminism it was just a female empowerment video and then i had these people come up and they're like why are you glorifying the soviet union and i was like what are you talking about did you watch the video i i, I pretty much made them look a horrible. lot of that <laughs> and that's the thing and i literally say in the video i'm like there's enough real life atrocities like i have a video where i recommend a book and the book I recommend is Max Hastings' Inferno, The World at War. Mm. And I mentioned one of the reasons I like that book is it has a lot of interviews with Soviet soldiers who are like, yeah, we were hungry all the time. Like, it sucked all the time. We were super racist to non-Russian Soviet soldiers. And it's like, I talk about that stuff a lot. I'm just saying 
you know, being in the Red Army sucked, you don't have to make stuff up. Like, show the 22 men who were hauled out and shot in the head in front of their comrades. Show people, I'm like, show people in the penal battalion. Have them do the suicide charge across the field. Or have them be a rear guard to get a factory out because they're viewed as less worthwhile than industrial material. Like, you just don't have to make stuff up. But even, I did one on the, a video why the Soviets took so many casualties in Barbarossa. <laughs> and not only did I get the apologist comments, I got comments from literal Nazis saying like, oh, really? well, if, you know, the Germans had wanted to be a better world. Yeah, one even said they called them the Jew SSR. I had to get rid of that one real quick. Wow. But then I have tankies coming at me saying, no, Stalin wasn't paranoid. Like the purge didn't. I have had comments on multiple videos saying the purges never happened. That's the like most there wasn't a ever. purge how can yeah, you say and that <laughs> read recently there are some books that say like maybe stalin was convinced by the nkvd and it wasn't as much his idea that it was the nkvd trying to clean house but like i've had some people straight up say these numbers aren't accurate and you know <sighs> You know, I feel like I'm not wrong. Maybe I am. I have to admit, like, obviously, I'm an English speaker. I'm American. So the sources I read are Western. The one thing I'd have Is to there a out... chance that I don't know what I'm talking about because I'm getting this from, you know, Russian academics who are then written about by British and American academics who then I'm building on? Maybe. But for people to straight up be like, no, Stalin. I, I had one comment. I actually had a talk with this person. We found middle ground in the end. But. They were like, well, Hitler never did a purge, and look at how that worked out for him. <laughs> so I've had people argue the purges were good. Like, it's just so fraught when you're talking about totalitarian regimes. And like you say, people get into this atrocity Olympics. Like, how dare you say anything that says anything even neutral or bad or good or whatever about these combatants because this other side did this. But if we think like that, how can we ever do deeper analysis? How like, it they, seems insane to me. I'd love to see people talking about the Eastern Front, who was the good guy there. Because that was the Olympics of which side can be worse to their own people and to the vice versa. <laughs> Eastern Front's like, uh, that's a hell of a topic for that. Especially for the people that are up, they're defending the Nazis in Barbarossa. I find that very interesting. I've seen that and I've seen, you know, and doing war games, because that's the other half of my channel. I do war game stuff. Man, the myth of the clean Wehrmacht has not gone away in war games. Oh, like, I, I love people who think, like, even the Nazi party, oh, look how structurally great it was. Look how everything ran. Look at their army. Like, they, this is a terrible government run absolutely garbagely. It's a joke. I get that comment a lot. <laughs> And the army wasn't like that was uh, Barbarossa. Most of those Germans had horses. Know, there wasn't only there were just tanks rolling up. It wasn't the it was an impressive feat, but it wasn't what people think as far as mobile warfare. Divisions were the Panzer divisions, and there were the elite units. But by and large, the Wehrmacht was horse drawn. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's just. I've seen that comment. I've seen people like down, you know, dislike the video and say, well, the Germans were more efficient. That's your answer. Why'd you make a 10 minute video on this? Like, <laughs> cause that's been in the historiography forever. I'm trying to use newer sources. Cause like they weren't. And like you say, the Nazi government, and this blows my mind why people still think they were hyper efficient. Cause even Alan Clark's Barbarossa. So like sources from the sixties and seventies show that it was almost futile. Like, these guys had their little fiefdoms, and they were happy to steal resources from their competitors yeah. at the detriment of the state if it enriched their own status. You know, I, I think for audiences yeah. that don't know so much, and I know it's boring when you talk history, everyone likes to learn about the battles, but if you learn about the economics behind the Third Reich, you immediately understand why the arm, like why the military collapsed the way it did. They didn't even have full pr mm -hmm. productivity till what, 44, when Albert Speer took over? They weren't even yeah. building everything on an assembly line properly. It was such a joke. They built fantastic works of art at the beginning, 
but that's all they had to use on the table. They couldn't meet productivity. God, um, I gotta look for it, but there is a lecture. Um, it was from the Battle of Kursk, and they were doing a Kursk conference, and like Dr. Robert Satino is one of the speakers, and he talks about the Battle of Kursk. But the guy after him actually has a master's in economics, and his entire lecture was looking at the production on the actual assembly lines of the Germans, the Americans, and the Soviets, and like how <laughs> that explains so much. Like he was showing on Tiger tanks and even Panzer IVs, the production, like just the process was so complex. They needed to mark in chalk where they were because it took so long and took so many days in sequence that they would forget what they were doing. Like each tank in some of these cases was a custom made work of art. And there were so many models and sub models and variations that it was almost like craftsmanship. Yep. Whereas like you say, the Americans with the, the assembly line we just wanted to mass produce them. And, you know, we even switched from like the Tommy gun to the M3 because we're thinking in terms of production capability, not necessarily like what is going to be sexy on a battlefield. Yeah, that's it. You had three tanks for every one of theirs and it worked. Sure. Bradley's, I mean, no one's going to, whatever. People are going to shit talk Sherman tanks and everything. But in the end, who had more tanks won? Because the Germans, if they weren't even doing Ford assembly line work, they were, like you said, making a tank almost like a few people mastering making it complete but you're producing one tank comparatively to the soviet union that was producing like 10 because they were learning from the americans and how to do assembly line work yeah yeah soviets were out producing very very early in the war but people never talk about that the germans like you mentioned another thing like america i read a book about uh lend lease and it talks about how the americans had been advising first russian then soviet industrial capacity and industrial processes since like the industrial revolution like america and russia actually had very close technical ties when it came to en engineering and production for years yeah there was people and the soviets definitely yeah Russia. and they definitely had their communist spin like here i'm linking you the lecture if you want to peruse it or show it like they show the russian factories and i would not have wanted to work in them they were dirty and cramped <laughs> compared to the american ones yeah. but it was basically a utilitarian communist version of the american production system and that's how they were able to chug out more tanks than the germans and like it's very telling that the soviets by themselves outproduced the germans and the americans by themselves outproduced the germans so again, I don't want to get into teleological arguments, but when you have the two biggest industrial powers on one side, it sure looks like a long shot to win the war. Especially when you look at Germany's situation as far as oil is concerned and the whole reason why Stalingrad occurred in the first place. They, so needless. They, they could have got to the oil fields if they just changed their directions around, but, you know, Hitler and Stalin and the... Uh, Poor decisions on both sides, I guess, but Stalingrad occurred, and you know, these people that are attacking you, that are trying to defend the uh, the Wehrmacht, uh, the Wehrmacht, and like how great it was, and how perfect, a lot of stories are coming out just to show how they were collaborating with the SS, and they knew about the camps, most of them, like, there's a lot more and more evidence piling up that this, this whole image is getting really destroyed. And it really goes back to the history. You know, you wanted to humanize the Germans after the war because the Cold War was going on and we needed mm -hmm. them on our side. So we put out this, the good Nazi kind of thing. And look at Albert Speer. His novel, it's completely lies. He made himself to look like he knew nothing about everything. He was designing these camps. Like, come on. You know, most of our history comes from this guy. And he wrote that, I think, in 71 or something when it came out. I'm not sure. You know, Franz Halder helps write the official history of the war with American advisors. <laughs> and so that's why the version we get of the Russians we get is always this disorganized mess because, you know, Halder only was there for 41 and 42 as far as the Russians are concerned. So he's only ever seen them at their worst before he was replaced. And the infantry manual for the U.S. Army in 1950 their estimates of Soviet military capabilities, tactics, whatever, was heavily influenced by the Germans. And like you say, denazification meant that 
America and Britain had to overlook it and had to push this like, no, we're friends with the Germans now. What do you mean Nazis? No, not the generals. They're good. Yeah, it was really. And then you have like. And then Guderian and Monstein, like their memoirs are so widely read and so influential. Like I talk about this in uh, my critique of Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, which, by the way, is a good way to get hate because people love that book. <laughs> but he he quotes Guderian and he quotes a lot of people without really high up people, I should say. That's one of my critiques of the book. It's not very bottom up, but he doesn't ever really scrutinize it. So when you have Guderian in his memoir literally saying, oh, yeah, I know there was a commissar law. I know there was a law about civilian conduct. Um, we, we just didn't follow those in my panzer group. We didn't commit war crimes and people take him at that. Like, of yeah. course, he's going to say that they didn't follow the war crime laws. Yep. And, and Monstein, even worse, Monstein tried to defend the commissar clause by saying, well, the commissar stood and Monstein is where we actually get a lot of this trope about men with the rifle, whatever. Monstein's like, well, the commissars were forcing the poor Russian peasants to go fight. So they were the bad guys. So it's fine if we killed them without trial. Like, you know, he talks about that when he was fighting um, at Sevastopol. And I know I pronounced that in the most American way Sevastopol. possible. I apologize. Oh, wow. Yeah. I know. I know. But like he talks about how the, the peasants were forced out of the caves and had a suicide charge at the Germans. And it was so much butchery. And he actually, Monstein says, I guess that's the Asiatic value of life. Yeah, yeah I know that. That's a great. And trip. so. Yeah. Uh, Asiatic hordes and like, you know, trying to distance the Soviets from being European and this mm -hmm. human wave stuff. And another one, of, it's from Alan Clark's Barbarossa. I keep forgetting who said it, but another general said, you know, it's like a swarm of ants taking down an elephant. Eventually yeah. the ants will win. Even I've read that one too. Yeah. You no, know, they're smaller. <laughs> like all that stuff comes from the Germans and we just took it at face value. Mm -hmm. Like there was no critical analysis really until you get guys like Glantz and House who after the Soviet archives at least partially open up, you get a lot of Russian writers who start using those sources. And then finally it gets over to the West in like the mid nineties. Yeah, but until period. then we just took it. at Yeah. We just took it at face value. And now the historiography is so messed up. There are people who just think the Wehrmacht was clean. And I saw recently on Facebook, someone was like Rommel versus uh, Zhukov, who was a better commander? And a lot of people were like, well, Rommel wasn't a Nazi and Zhukov was a communist, so Rommel wins. Like, really? Wow, okay. Like, yeah, he was part of the plot against Hitler, but, like, that's become part of the myth, too, that Rommel was this noble soldier who was never into it. And, you know, I've read so many things, but that was kind of mythologized, too. Like, all I... these dudes, it was in their interest to distance themselves. You know, if I went to dinner tonight, went went to my parents' place, I asked my dad, you know, if you had to say who was a good Nazi, he'd say Rommel. Because yeah, I grew up hearing that, too. Mm -hmm. You know, Rommel, he wasn't like the rest. And uh, he got killed because he was uh, anti-Nazi party and everything. I'm like, oh, okay, you take that at face value. And that's what's been told a lot. But, yeah, the real history is not so clean. Uh, this is actually running pretty long now. <laughs> I don't know, should we uh, finish off with a little bit in the downfall? Uh, yeah, you kind of cut up for a minute. You're oh. just saying real history is not that complicated and or not that simple. simple. I know words. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, real history is not complicated at all. Anyone could do. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we can do downfall and probably call it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think this is going to be an interesting one because that works for me. Our audiences are both obviously almost all Americans, so I don't know how many people saw this movie, even though it's a fantastic movie. The uh, Untergang, the downfall, showing the uh, scene. I first saw it as Der Untergang. It wasn't downfall for me, I but it... I was in, in high school. I took German, and so the German club gave us, uh, oh. I think, and my humanities class in high school. I got, like, double credit if I watched it and talked about it because they wanted us to wow, I'm surprised. do cultural things. Oh, I'm surprised. That's actually really cool. I I stumbled upon this because I guess I had just been entering CJ, uh, col college, you, you would call it, it's post-secondary before university here, and my friend who was German was like, you should really watch this, it's a fantastic film. I was like, oh, okay. 
and yeah, it was immediately it was like, wow, this is really well done, and it's I think it's arguably one of the mm. most historically accurate films. I honestly tried to find some dirt on it, and there's just very little. There's only minor things like some people didn't necessarily exist. The young boy per se was kind of loosely based off of someone, but he probably didn't exist in the way that they're showing the Hitler Youth. And uh, well, yeah, the main woman. Um, actually, I have to look up her her name. Uh, Troidel, the secretary. The only thing that they don't show, and I know why they probably didn't do this, is you know she escapes the bunker at the end with the little boy on her bicycle, and then everything's happily ever after. The reality was mm-hmm. she was brutally raped by Soviets, and she was used as a plaything by a Soviet major for a while. But she was alive when they were filming this, so mm-hmm. I think out of respect to her, they didn't add that in. But I would just add that that's kind of the reality of what happened in that war. And I think people should know that, yeah, after Barbarossa and the Germans raped and did horrible things to the Soviets, the Soviets probably did it twofold on them, especially in Prussia. And actually, um, I don't know, have you read uh, Cornelius Ryan's The Last Battle? Mm-hmm. The one on... Oh, is that Castle Itter? Uh, no, the last battle, it's the Battle of Berlin. By oh, Belgo, no, I have this now. Oh, it's really good, because even though he was writing in the 70s, his thing, and this is, again, why I take down Shire, he was so much about, like, interviewing regular people. He has tons of diaries and interviews with civilians, and luckily he got to them in the 60s and 70s, so there's still a lot of archives there. Oh. And he does a big section on German women and their recollections of inner, you know, interactions with the Soviet soldiers and talking about how like some convents, the nuns were straight up committing suicide because they were worried about, you know, being dishonored and they'd break their covenant with God and how some German women actually in interviews said that they said going into the battle, they knew there would be atrocities because they knew what had happened to the Soviets. Like, you know you mentioned earlier a lot of germans tried to pretend they didn't know what was going on in the eastern front at least in the 60s and 70s these women getting interviewed by ryan were saying no we knew and we knew it would be payback and um one of the interactions that a woman remembers there were uh guards troops that came into her house first and she thought she was going to be assaulted but the guards troops were very honest with her they said hey we're the elite like there are conscripts coming up next you are going to be raped like they were very blunt about that and so that book was just interesting because it doesn't shy away from it but a lot of it is regular soviet soldiers and their recollections and then regular german women yeah, and their s- recollections something i i've heard and i've even seen it written is it's an interesting comparison that what you're mentioning about the clean fam act in the red army they usually perpetuate, you know, the officers tried to keep the rabble in line, but you had those Red Army members that would get into the rape. They even try and clean it up a bit on the, the Russian side. A lot of sources are trying to do the same thing. And it's interesting because I know that there's work being done now probably by um, female documentarians trying to look at, like, how really bad the rapes were. And personally, I lived in Germany briefly. I had a, a German girlfriend. Her, her grandfather was actually involved in the war. And just from her family alone, I've the stories are <laughs> very graphic and horrible, especially in Prussia. And uh, mm-hmm. I don't think it's talked about often. It's just, you know, what Germany did, and they don't talk about what happened when the Russians came in. With Prussia, the huge displacement, like, these Germans had colonized as they went east and kind of created an empire... And then when the Soviets come back through, like the ones who weren't killed or in prison, like they had to leave and the borders of Germany drastically changed. Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, my ex who was German, she lived on the boundaries of uh, Prussia and Poland and her family's farm was changed. I think in history from Polish to, uh, to Prussian many times over. And then, once the war occurred and her, her grandfather ran for his life to get captured by Americans because he didn't want to get captured by the Soviets. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. they, they moved 
to Dusseldorf, which is as far away from the Russian side as you can get, <laughs> for good reason. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but Ryan uh, stuff too. For the... A lot of a lot of German citizens either fleeing west or hoping and praying and reading newspapers that the Allies would beat the Russians. Or I should say the Soviets, excuse me. I'm trying to get better about that. Yeah, her, her grandfather was uh, Hitler Jung, and I, that sounds awful. Yeah, he was forced into Hitler Youth or whatever you want to be told. This is an old man. I heard this story when he was 80-something years old, to anyone who might question this. He ran with 10 of his friends. He was positioned on the Eastern Front, and they literally ran for their lives as far west as they could, and they managed to find Americans, and they were crying with joy when the Americans took him prisoner literally crying mm -hmm. it was that terrifying you know this is anic this is anecdotal too but i had a buddy whose grandfather uh he was almost impressed into uh der hitler jugend and like same thing he, in the movie portrays this he was given a panzerfaust and told like <laughs> you need to take down a t-85 like that is your job like yeah or t-34 85 yeah he's like that is your that's your goal and the the story, at least again, anecdotally, was the war ended like just before his unit actually went into action. But he remembers that he's like, you know, I'm a little boy and they give me a one shot weapon and told me, like, go destroy a tank. Yeah, it's shown in the film so somewhat, but uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of an, un you know, we, we do learn about it in history. It's the horrible stand Berlin made with the, what, 70,000 old people and young mm -hmm. kids. I don't know. Maybe a movie should be made just to show how awful that was as a situation. Like, oof. The focus of the film, though, I thought it did a pretty good job showing the role of the Hitler Jugend and their, the, you know, uh, Der Bund, Der Deutsche made a, Deutsche made a, oh my God, my German has gotten so horrible these last few years and showing the Volkssturm and like how it really was you had some fanatics who were holding out but a lot of it was them just scraping the bottom of the barrel and they show like the civilians who didn't want to fight for the Volkssturm being killed by the Nazis but then the other option is you're killed by the Russians and just how desperate it was for the Ber Berliners at the time and you know I, I think it gets that across pretty well I, I'm it's been so long since I've seen the movie but the one thing I really liked was the de depiction of Hitler in his final moments, you know, his hand behind his back, he's shaking and twitching. Did they actually show him receiving opiates or any drugs? I don't remember. Um, he, I think he got examined by doctors. I don't know if they show him, it, it's been a few years, if they show him actually taking drugs. Because I find that's been some of the more interesting new research into, you know, the cocktails that had to be given to him, especially after one of the, uh, you know, it was in the, I think in the movie Valkyrie, one of the attempts on his life where they were blowing up the briefcase, he didn't recover after. He was mm. completely dosed up on cocaine or opiates so there's all these different doctor stories he he was complete mess and it really they show that in the film how deteriorated he is he just he's gone mentally and everything he's telling people to go on suicide missions and such and ranting and moving units that don't exist and but look yeah. at like how iconic that is talking about the movie being effective that became a meme like the I ranting know. hitler is such a big internet meme and people just put whatever they want over it but like that is how good of a portrayal he did of someone who's just unhinged and having this fantasy of this war that really doesn't exist with units that have long ceased to function. Oh, you know what? In my brief research, though, I did find something that they did change for the film, but it's not on Hitler. It's about Goebbels. And it's they changed some, uh, some quotations on Goebbels, and it's interesting. In the movie... Let me look at it. Goebbels mentions that uh, when people are saying, you know, the Germans, we can't fight any longer. They're losing. They're going to be in Berlin. Goebbels goes, oh, the German people are having their throats cut. And that's the quote in the movie. The actual quote in history in the bunker, because it's well documented by people that were talking to him. He was uh, having an emotional outburst because in his own words, and I have the English here. What can I do with a nation whose men don't even fight anymore when their women are being raped in anger he also says yes that might surprise some people including my colleagues but 
have no illusions. I've never compelled anyone to work for me, just as we didn't compel the German people. They themselves gave us the job to do. Why do you work with me? Now you'll have your little throat cut. He was responding to the guy that was talking to him, because the guy was saying, we can't expect these Germans to fight any longer. They just simply can't. And this really angered him. And he left the room with these mm. really chilling words. He says, striding towards the door, he turned around once more and shouted, but the earth will shake when we leave the scene. <laughs> they didn't put that in the movie from Gobbles. I thought that would have been yeah fantastic because he knew it was over at that point and Well, they all did, of course. But uh, for Gobbles to lose his cool because, you know, he's that reptilian, cold, propagandist character. Oof. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I read into what he was actually saying before all this, and he was throwing the German people under the bus. He was saying they were becoming cowards, they weren't willing to fight anymore, and they they were at fault, and now Germany was paying for it. But the high command wasn't responsible yeah. for any of this. <laughs> he, he says Doesn't the, the, the film have Hitler say some stuff like that? Like, the German people, if they're not willing to win, they don't deserve to be saved. Yeah, that's uh, that's actually what. Like, I I think. Yeah, that's the quotes from Gobbles. They but just I, I gave Hitler it to Hitler. Say that. Yeah, they they made that yeah. change, but you know, because Gobbles isn't the main person. I guess people, I guess wouldn't recognize him as much as Hitler, maybe. But uh, yeah, I, I I really can't remember yeah. this movie too well. I was interested when they're running away from the bunker. I was wondering if it's a contentious thing. Martin Bormann, the uh, secretary in the end to Hitler because there's a lot of contradictory remarks about did he run away when Hitler was dead did he survive did he get shot did he end up dying in the bunker like no one really knows I don't remember the movie how they portray this for the life of me to go back and watch I don't <laughs> I don't know how it ended for him I do know they did an excellent job with uh, Gobble's wife um uh, Magda, when she kills the children, <laughs> that must have made they, audience... They make it really chilling and raw. Yeah, like it's unsettling as ever. I think for American audiences, too, who might not be so familiar with the inner workings of the Nazis, like that must be like grueling to watch. <laughs> mm -hmm. For American schools, and I don't know how it is in Canada, the Eastern Front as a whole is always a sideshow, like... You know, the Battle of Berlin is sort of talked about, and then it immediately goes into, like, the end of Japan. Even Stalingrad, every single... And I don't have a high school history textbook in a while because I haven't taught high school history in a few years, but Stalingrad is always shoved in with Midway and with El Alamein as the three turning points, and they are always given equal footing in turning the war around. Even though if you look at the numbers of Stalingrad and look at the numbers of the Eastern Front, like, you know, uh, House, he puts it at 82% of the German combat casualties were against the Soviets. That's the low estimate. Uh, Max Hastings puts it at 90%. But for Americans, like, you look at our movies and stuff, you get, like, Band of Brothers, you get... Um, I can't even think of the big one. Saving Private Ryan. Like, so much the West, the old ones, Longest Day, Battle of the Bulge, Bridge, Bridge Too Far. Bridge Too Far, yeah. I don't, American kids just don't ever learn about the brutality and extent of the Eastern Front. It's the same in Canada. We have, well, it's a mirror of, the only thing that we changed for Canada is we were more involved in the Sicilian campaign in Italy. So we kind of go over that and the, the Netherlands because the only places Canada kind of did by itself was the Netherlands. So that's the big one we talk about. But yeah, we mirror American. Mm -hmm. Like, we learn about the Pacific War. So that kind of tells you something. Technically, we had volunteers, but we weren't that involved. But yeah, the Eastern Insane. Front. Uh, Eastern Front we don't touch upon. We just learned, like you said, Stalingrad. That's about it. And it's a pivotal moment. And once Stalingrad is won, then it's like, oh, okay, and then the Russians are in Berlin. Stalingrad, but at the same time, El Alamein, and at the same time, Midway. But don't compare the numbers of those three things. They're all equal. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. I'm trying to remember in high school how we learn about the Pacific War, because 
it's not much. It's not. We, we just maybe we learn about Midway. That's about it. Yeah. I'm trying to think. I don't know if the Philippines were huge, but you definitely get Pearl Harbor, get Midway, get Guadalcanal. Um, we'll see. You know what we don't get? 43. Bombing hmm. of Tokyo. And the bombing of Japan, like uh, Curtis, LeMay, firebombing. And then they don't ever bring that up, I find. Because mm -hmm. that's... Uh, those numbers are contentious with the nuke, aren't they? That's something a lot of people should know. It's what it was like for... Uh, yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, you know, when you... I, I don't think we should get into the topic of the whole nuke question, because people mm -hmm. scream. But, uh, yeah, Curtis LeMay bombing yeah. Japan. I think that's something a lot of people need to be taught. Oh, so, it's not usually in books, but I talk about that with my students, that, like... Tokyo was hit harder than either of those places, but I use that often when, you know, I'm trying to, especially with the sixth graders, because they have trouble conceiving of a nuclear bomb. Uh. I explain to them, like, to destroy a city with conventional weapons, we did in Tokyo, we basically destroyed it, but it took so many more resources than we have these bombs, and the two bombs are comparable to entire air wings, and that's usually how I bring that up, but again, I don't do high school anymore, so it's not on the have-to-do curriculum, but you know, we, we talk about Chernobyl when we do transboundary pollution. So anytime I mention nuclear, they ask about bombs, and that's usually how we get into that. Well, I think we've covered quite a lot. Well, thank you, everyone. This has been another episode of the History Roundtable podcast with Craig from NBS History. I definitely encourage you guys to check out his channel because it's awesome. And so thanks once again for being on the show. Thank you have you back soon so that's it for me thank you guys for listening and stay excited about history